Well, good morning and welcome to this really exciting event. My name is Glenn Davis and I want to start, of course, by acknowledging that I meet you today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people who've been the custodians of this land for thousands of years. Can I welcome everybody to this second event in the Paul Ramsey's Foundation's inaugural series, Disrupting Disadvantage. And today we're focused on disruptive data. What role should data play? in disrupting disadvantage. What are the trends, but also the concerns worth consideration? And to explore these questions, we have with us the innovative, the curious research of our panel speakers. Deborah, if I could start with you, how important is the sort of insights that we've just heard from Stefan around how data can be used at this question? And in particular, his call in closing that data needs to speak to action in order to be worthwhile? I think that data has been very disruptive in Australia, but that moment was probably two decades ago. So when I think about the really disruptive event that, that I always point to when I talk to students about this, it was the, the moment that um, the Department of Social Services made available all of the administrative data on income support records from the Social Security Agency one of the things that we learned that was really important is that when you put the data together from across a range of programs, the idea that the safety net was simply providing temporary support to people when they fell into bad circumstances and then they would disappear again because they, you know, life had turned around for them, that turned out not to be accurate. What we discovered was that there's a large cross section of the population that spends a long time on payments and what they're doing is they're actually moving from one to another and if you don't have that linked you don't know that. Deborah thank you for that. I'd like to turn to Ray on another issue that Stefan raised and that's the social license to operate with data which is hugely important. Uh, Ray has uh, reported and spoken very eloquently about unfortunately the significant mistrust between for example Indigenous communities and data actors. Can you talk to us a bit about how social license works and why this is an important consideration to think about data as a disruptor. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's a long history uh, in Australia, you know, of data being weaponized against certain populations. Uh, so, you know, of course, I'm talking about First Nations people. So that was right from the early days um, in terms of uh, how to uh, extract the resources of First Nations people. And there's been an ongoing sort of continuation of that about how to exclude uh, First Nations people from uh, these different uh, opportunities, shall we say, and data again is another one of them. But more broadly, the stuff I'm really interested in is what do First Nations people want? What matters to them? Uh, because there's limited opportunity there as well. But when you're talking about transforming reality, so the descriptive thing, like whose reality are we talking about? Because the people analysing the data, it's usually their reality. And so if you're a minority or from a different background or have a different culture, that data is not going to reflect your reality, which is why this stuff is important for different groups. Thank you, Ray. And so if I could turn to you on a, on a related aspect, could you tell us a bit more about this research and again, drawing on Stefan's observations around the importance of translation to action, what this means? Yeah, I mean, I think I come from, you know, a startup background and um, so in that sense, we are very disruptive. We're trying to disrupt the way things are done. And the way that I came to this was because I noticed that when we can represent data across space, um, so for example, mapping data, we can really transform the way that um, decision makers view our reality. And so one example that I like to give is when I was working um, at Plan International and I um, decided that I really wanted to push for this project called Free to Be. It ended up being Australia's first ever crowd mapping platform for women to map street harassment. And it was pre Me Too. It was, you know, a different time really in 2016. The project ended up being extremely kind of successful. I mean, heaps of people, um, hundreds, thousands actually, from um, in the end all over the world ended up using this platform um, because we scaled it. For decision makers, it's crucial to know what is the causal relationship rather than just correlation. 
We risk the claim that data analytics can deliver more than it can. The ultimate question is, you know, how do we move from correlation to causation? We actually do spend a lot of time on trying to map the issues and then source the community on what from all those issues and possible variables, which ones do you believe are worthwhile prioritizing, right? And I think that is uh, one way to actually anyway, go beyond the individual anyway, in researcher, but actually have a broader community reflect on variables that are worthwhile uh, identifying and studying from a causality and correlation uh, point of view. Deborah, in your work addressing poverty, you worked hard to bring together multiple sources of data around an aggregate picture using the HILDA survey as your baseline. And I, I just know from talking to you how difficult sometimes that was, particularly when you're dealing with government data and they want high levels of de-identification so that people can't track individuals and so on. How do you respond to this question of what sort of incentives can we get to encourage much more collaboration around major holders of, of data? The issue that you have to grapple with is what are their constraints? And they are extremely constrained. So I was once had the experience of sitting in you know, one of the state treasurer's office and I was telling him some fabulous research around you know, why stamp duty was a bad form of taxation. And he interrupted me almost immediately to say, we know all of that. Of course we know that. But here's 10 reasons why we can't actually do anything about that. So our problem is not new information. Ray, you've uh, been a notable critic of what you've sometimes called open slather data. That is complete public access to material which separates it from the human element of what it is that we're covering. We want to ensure that disadvantaged communities are not at the mercy of an algorithm. How do we organise and publicise data so that we give power to the end user? We've seen the result of open slather data here in Australia. Um, there's been one in notable instance uh, I, I can recall, uh, which was shut down pretty quickly. Um, but uh, I, th I think um, you know, that concept of open data um, doesn't specify um, uh, an absence of governance of data. And I think we have to be very clear about that in that we can make data accessible uh, in an appropriate manner. Um, and that's usually through really good data governance. Uh, it's about reframing uh, what, what those communities want from the data. We also need to talk about what is good um, data governance. Um, and that's kind of been part of the conversation that's been lacking, I think. Uh, we've set up a framework that's been guided by Indigenous people um, and those people assess whether that data is to be used that way. What Ray was saying is really interesting and it just reminded me of um, these concepts um, where there is tension between these two concepts, the data ethics and then the data justice. Um, so data ethics really um, I guess locates the issue at the point of the individual or the technical level and data justice really tries to look at um, existing systems of oppression and acknowledge structural power. So I like to think um, about how to balance both of them in our work. Yeah, it's it's so important that we put that that privacy and security and the data justice like kind of and bring them together and put them at the forefront of what we do. I'm wondering as you hear the conversation, what you would say to us, all of us who are trying to think in Australia about how we use data to better inform public policy, to better inform our analysis, to inform change in our society. What do you other, when you think about your work, the priority actions that you look for from others to make a difference? Uh, it's, uh, it's really about um, anyway, not just opening up, but also about the right governance structure, which is why data can be disruptive, but it can also be disruptive in a negative way. And so how do we, anyway, prevent misuses, but also prevent misuses for indeed those that are traditionally uh, quite often not in the data set or already uh, excluded from uh, actually the decision-making process. And I think that's the real uh, task ahead. And that's where I think we need to become more sophisticated. What is the priority from here in particular as the Paul Ramsey Foundation thinks about how we might help 
uh, in developing some of the data literacy and availability that, that has been discussed here. Deborah, what's the priority action for you as you think about what we need? We need to be working harder to resolve the gap between you know, in principle or in theory access and practical access. So we have in theory access to a lot of things which actually have very big practical hurdles in terms of making sense of them. Helping shape conversations around priorities, bringing people in to make sure that we have social license to do the things that we want to do, and then resolving some of these practical hurdles that people have in access to data. So it's related to the question issue that Stefan raised, but I think um, to get there, um, to get to the important questions and the priorities, we have to ask the people um, what matters to them, what is important to them, what is important to uh, non-Indigenous people and uh, particularly mostly the policy makers, uh, and what matters to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people down on the ground, often two very different things. Um, and so for the questions to mean something, um, you know, you have to ask the people um, about what matters. For me, I think our priority area for me is all about closing data gaps. Um, so obviously I'm focused on um, gender data gaps, um, but there are all sorts. We know that there are four main barriers um, for reporting um, sexual assault and gender-based violence for women. How do we partner with decision makers in an effective kind of collaborative way to ensure that they can actually use the insights um, and that they're at the right stage to use the right types of insights to make long-term and preventative change um, into the future. Thank you. It's been a really, really um, exciting, interesting, informative uh, time. Thank you for making it possible uh, and see you all.